Welcome to Emergency Chaos, where we provide tips and tricks to make you a better nurse. Today, we are going over hyperkalemia, including what it is, EKG findings, and the treatment methods available and most commonly used in the emergency department. Hyperkalemia is a high potassium level inside the blood. It can be as a result of kidney failure, acute or chronic, since the kidneys won't filter out or regulate potassium levels, or it can be as a result of cellular release, like from burns and crush injuries, among others. In the ER, we commonly see it in renal patients, patients with chronic kidney disease who are on dialysis. The main reason we worry about hyperkalemia is because it can have an effect on cardiac conduction. It irritates the heart, and if left untreated, it can eventually lead to cardiac arrest. The main priority, as with any patient with a cardiac-related complaint, is performing an EKG. This will allow you to see if there is any hyperkalemic specific EKG changes, which we are going to be discussing on the next slides. Next, of course, is obtaining a potassium level. Then, most importantly, is treating if needed. Note that there will be plenty of times when it's an accidental finding. For example, the patient is in the ER for something different and the potassium comes, comes back very elevated. Or perhaps also the patient is there for a different complaint an ECG gets done and you see that there are specific EKG changes. So that keep that at the back of your mind that a lot of times it's gonna be an accidental random finding. The textbook hyperkalemia changes on an ECG include peak T waves progressing onto the disappearing of P waves with a widening QRS complex and ultimately with any arrhythmia, arrhythmia rising out of it like VFib, VTAC, and heart blocks and ultimately arrest. The key thing with EKGs and patients with hyperkalemia is that an arrhythmia, any arrhythmia or change in the ECG should be treated as it signals that the heart is being irritated by the, by the high levels of potassium. So as I said, the textbooks are the things that I just mentioned, but if the potassium is high and there's any arrhythmia or any change in the ECG rhythm from the patient's baseline, it needs to be treated because there is, it's showing that the heart is being irritated. Here, I wanted to show in leads v4 that there's peak t waves as you can see here and here and then in v5 v6 like there's no more p waves so when you have an ekg and you see a peak t wave or no p waves specifically combined in having the uh high potassium it kind of says hey this patient is exhibiting the symptoms of hyperkalemia we should get on it and start treating this and then here i wanted to provide an example with peak t waves so the next time you perform an ECG and you see this, you better recognize it, right? So here we can see the peak T waves throughout uh, V3, V4, V5, all of them. You see that they're really tall, they're really big, they're even higher in the QRS complex. And then here at the top, I wanted to show what I mean by a widening QRS. So up here, you can see that it's getting bigger, it's getting bigger, and it's getting bigger, right? And compared to the previous one, they were very small. These are the QRSs and they're very small, but on the next right here, they're getting wider and wider and wider. And then ultimately, if you don't do anything about it, you don't give any of the treatments that we're going to be discussing shortly. It can lead to VTAG, VFib, heart blocks, and then ultimately like uh, a systole and cardiac arrest. Now, let's get into the treatments. There's two types of treatments, essentially those that are going to stabilize or redistribute the potassium within the body. And then the other treatments that excrete potassium out of the body. We're first going to start with the treatments that stabilize or redistribute the potassium in the body. So here, the medication that needs to be given first, always needs to be given first is calcium because calcium stabilizes the cardiac membrane and decreases the heart excitability. By doing this, by giving the calcium first, you then have more time to get the other treatments ready. So usually you're going to do calcium gluconate, giving one to three grams over 10 minutes so calcium gluconate one to three grams over 10 minutes however there's also calcium chloride which are those amps that you have in your car crash carts that can be given but calcium chloride is more concentrated than calcium gluconate but in super severe patients it may be chosen so just know that you'll give approximately 5 to 10 ml of the 10 percent calcium chloride so i'll be three grams one to three grams of the calcium gluconate over 10 minutes or it'll be five to 10 mls of the 10 percent calcium 
chloride solution. So next is insulin and dextrose. Insulin is going to shift potassium back into the cell, decreasing the potassium available in the blood. Usually, you're going to give 5 units of regular insulin, insulin IV for kidney patients and 10 units of regular insulin for other patients. As insulin is excreted by the kidneys, and if the kidneys aren't working well, you don't want to give more insulin to kidney patients because the insulin will remain in the bloodstream and will keep tanking your patient, botting them out. So that's why we give five units for those patients who are kidney patients and 10 for other patients. We give the dextrose amp with the insulin in order to prevent the, the sugar, the blood glucose from going down and dropping your patient consistently because it has its own uh, very bad things that occur, right? And then of course, before giving the insulin, you want to check your patient's blood sugar because if it's already below 100, you may need to start them on a drip of like D5 or D10 before even considering administering insulin because you don't want them to go hypoglycemic. Next is going to be bicarb, which helps drive potassium back into the cell as well. So remember that acidosis drives potassium out of the cell into the bloodstream. So bicarb does the opposite by driving it back into the cell. And know that bicarb will most of the time be given no matter what, but it really works well in situations where the patient is a little bit acidotic. And you'll be giving probably one or two amps of the bicarb in hyperkalemia. Next, especially in your kidney patients on dialysis, dialysis needs to happen as soon as possible to get the potassium out of the body but remember that getting dialysis started takes time so you may be giving the other treatments especially the potassium in the meantime to stabilize the patient while dialysis gets started on your patient and then remember that there's also lasix that can be given as it is a potassium wasting diuretic but if the patient's kidneys don't work and they're not producing urine it's not going to have an effect right there's also albuterol, which helps shift potassium back into the cell. But if your heart is already irritated from the hyperkalemia, you don't want to give a medication that's going to increase the heart rate and cause further instability and irritation. And then there's also other medications like Localma and Kayexalate. They're both going to be PO and essentially they bind potassium inside the GI tract and then it gets excreted. However, they take hours for them to start working. So if your patient needs treatment now, it's not going to have much effect and it's going to take time getting these medications ready instead of like doing other things like giving the calcium and giving the insulin and dextrose and the bicarb and calling uh, the dialysis people to come and do dialysis. So you won't waste your time in the very beginning, but at some point you may be uh, asked to give the Localma or Kayexalate. So let's talk about some nursing specific things. Hyperkalemic patients need to be on a cardiac monitor due essentially due to the risk of the risk of life-threatening arrhythmia. So just keep that at the back of your mind. If your patient's hyperkalemic, do your best to put them on a, hype, on a cardiac monitor. And then I've said this already, but I want to drive the point home. You have to, you need to give the calcium first because it stabilizes the cardiac membrane, buying you time to get other treatments ready. And then if you want a rough potassium level, you can send a VBG because it's super quick. You get it in. Uh, you get the blood, you send it off, and usually it comes back in, in 10 minutes, where if you send a, a BMP to the lab, it can take up to even an hour. So just remember that if you want to get a quick potassium level, you can send off a VBG. And then I think perhaps the most important thing out of all of this is that the only insulin that can go IV is going to be regular insulin. Don't forget that. The only insulin that can go IV is regular insulin. Insulin, And in hyperkalemia, the insulin that you're going to be giving is going to be IV, not subcutaneously. So IV insulin is regular insulin. And then renal patients often don't have the best veins for IV access. So if your organization allows it, learn how to do or how to perform an external jugular IV as most, most dialysis patients still have good EJs for cannulation. Again, even though your patient will get dialyzed, you still want to be giving other treatments like uh, the calcium and then know that pseudo hyperkalemia or a false reading can occur if the tourniquet that you placed was on for too long or if it was too tight or if you used a syringe to get the blood out because it causes cellular destruction so there may be times when you have to repeat it especially when it just doesn't uh, fit the patient presentation symptoms or even the ecg findings so now let's go into the question of the day what is 
the dosing for Tylenol in pediatric patients? As always, the answer to the question of the day will be at the bottom of the description text. I think that being a good ER nurse depends a lot on your experiences and taking the time to look up and familiarize yourself with topics that you don't fully understand. I've listed my favorite ER nursing related books in the description, and I believe you can greatly benefit from taking the time to read them. As always, as always, keep learning. Don't, free, don't be afraid to ask questions. Ask as many questions as you can. You'll be a better nurse. You'll be a safer nurse. And then if you enjoyed the content, share with your friends, a like and a follow. I would really appreciate that. And if you want to learn about anything, I'm making a list um, so I can add it onto my list so I can make future videos on it. And if you want to support, I also have a little Redbubble account where there's some stickers and shirts on there. And then as always, teamwork makes the dream work. And here at Emergency Chaos, we are proactive, not reactive.